The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Tom again. I'd like to welcome you all this morning to the next installment of my technical webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about the preparation and analysis in soils and solid matrices. I know you all have a really busy schedule and I appreciate very much you taking your time out to be with me this morning. I'm hoping you'll all walk away with something new and think about and hopefully you can take away something that will help you improve not only your quality but your understanding of the preparation and analysis of soil products. So for those of you who know me, and those of you who don't, my name is Tom Wadera. I am the technical manager here at ERA. Um, I've been here for almost 17 years now. I've been in the industry for about 30. My specialty here at ERA is inorganic and air and emissions chemistries. And hopefully we'll have some fun this morning and we'll get some good information by. Just a couple of quick things about ERA. ERA was founded back in 1977. We are currently located in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains in beautiful Golden, Colorado. ERA services more than 7,000 laboratories in 80 countries with our products. We are accredited as a PT provider by A2LA. We have certifications in ISO 17043, ISO Guide 34, and our laboratory is an ISO 17025 accredited laboratory. ERA makes proficiency testing and CRMs in a variety of different matrices, including wastewater, drinking water, soils, air and emissions, microbiology, and radiochemistry. If you ever look in our catalog and you don't see what you want, we also have a department making custom standards. We can make you just about anything you want at any concentration you want. Just give us a call. A couple of special notes before we begin this morning. For all of you that are attending, we will be sending you a copy of the slide presentation in your email. Also, as with all of our webinars and all of our presentations, it will be available for you to look at and download off of our website within about 48 hours from today. So, if you know anybody who can't make the webinar today and you feel that they can benefit from the information, have them jump on our website and they can get the information from there. So, our agenda for today. And for those of you that have been with me in the past, we're going to do things a little different. Normally we focus on one, possibly two topics, and we go into real depth in those topics. We've never done anything with regards to analyzing soil products, and it's very different than analyzing water products. So what I'm going to do today is we'll talk a little bit about the NELAC criteria and the acceptance limits so that you have an understanding of how you get judged when you enter results on our website for your PT and how the acceptance limits are calculated for that. And then we're going to go into talking about the various ERA products and soil and solid matrices and talk more specifically about how to run those. Because again, it is very different than running our water products. And there's going to be a common theme today about following the method exactly as it's written. And we'll discuss why we need to do that. So first, and I get a lot of questions about this, is when I send in my PT results, how do you know how to judge the results? How do you know whether I pass or fail? So we'll talk a little bit about that. So the acceptance limits and the assigned values differ in soil samples from they do in water samples. The test methods that are available for the majority of solid samples do not quantitatively recover 100% of the analyte spiked into the soil which is very different than water. Water sample, you can spike in aluminum at a certain concentration and you should get it all back. That's not the case for soils. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And in some cases, what you can get back is dramatically different than what goes in. Also, the nature of the soil itself being used to fortify for the products can dramatically affect the leaching efficiency of an analyte. Here's an example. In the 17 years that I've been here, we've used a variety of different soil matrices to spike um, the analytes into. We take, let's take hexachrome, for example. It's not uncommon for one batch of blank soil to be able to only leach out 
say 35 to 40 percent of the hexachrome that spiked in, whereas another batch you might be able to leach out 70 to 75 percent. So the nature of that soil, the amount of fines in there, the silicate structures that are in there, all can affect how much of the analyte can be leached out by the various methods available. With very few exceptions, the acceptance limits for soils are based upon the mean of the reported results of the study. And that's because the different matrices, the different backgrounds and soils that we use and that all providers use will leach out different amounts. So it's very difficult to say, well, your acceptance limits are going to be based upon a 50% recovery for hexachrome because it's not true for different matrices. So for soils, you're truly being judged against your peer laboratories. So if we get 100 data points for, say, our anions and soil, the mean of those 100 data points will become the assigned value because that's the amount of analyte that can truly be leached out. And then the limits themselves will either be based on a three standard deviations from those reported results or a three standard deviation based on that standard deviation calculation from the NELAC fields of proficiency testing. So that will vary. So let's go through a quick example so that you can see how acceptance limits are calculated. Let's take bromide, for example, in the anions. So let's say the mean of the study was 50 milligrams per kilogram. Bromide is one of the analytes that there is an expected standard deviation from the FOPTs, or the fields of proficiency testing. And those expected standard deviations are based upon all the results that have been reported in the proficiency testing studies over the past 30 or 40 years. So we'll calculate an expected standard deviation for bromide based on the mean of 50 milligram per kilogram. So what we do to generate a standard deviation is those FOPTs have columns which we call the ABCD columns. For soils, the A and B column is generally the mean of the study, again with very few exceptions. Your C column, which you see in the calculation, is the expected standard deviation in decimal form. And then our D factor is a concentration dependent factor. So as I'm sure a lot of you know, it's a lot easier to recover something at a higher concentration than it is at a lower concentration. So that D factor takes that into consideration. So the lower the concentration of the standard, the more that D factor comes into play and the wider your acceptance limits will be. The higher the concentration, the less that D factor comes into play and the tighter the limits were going to be. And that is, again, because it's a lot easier to recover something at a higher concentration than at a lower one. So what we first do is we calculate out a single standard deviation. So we take our 50, which is our study mean, we multiply that by the C factor, which for bromide is 0 0.0848 from the FOPTs. So that means you have a standard deviation, of a, an expected standard deviation of approximately 8.5%. We then add to that the concentration dependence factor, which is in units of milligram per kilogram, of 0.3989. And we come up with a single standard deviation of 4.639 milligrams per kilogram. So that is what the expected standard deviation would be based on the value being 50. We then take that value and we multiply it by 3. For soil analyses, your acceptance limits are plus or minus three standard deviations. So we take that 4.639, multiply by three, and we get a value of 13.9. So then your acceptance limits are going to be your study mean of 50 minus 13.9 to plus 13.9. So we take our value of 50, we subtract out 13.9, and our low value will be 36.1. We then take the 50, we add the 13.9, and our high value will be 63.9. So the limits for this particular analyte and this standard would be 36.1 to 63.9 milligrams per kilogram. So in your PT, if you report a value within those, those, sam uh, those numbers, you'll get an acceptable result on the report we send back to you. If you're outside of those numbers, you'll get a not acceptable report. 
And again, for me, I feel one of the benefits of this is that you're truly being judged against your peer laboratories. With this in mind, it's very important that we run samples exactly as the methods are written. For some of the products, there are specific methods that need to be followed. And we'll discuss those methods, and I'll explain if we don't follow those methods, how that can affect our analyses. For other samples, there are a variety of, of acceptable methods to use, and I'll go over the more common ones that I see for our proficiency tests. So let's first start out with the metals and soil. That's a big one. There's a lot of you that use that, and there's a lot of analytes in it, and there's a lot of things that can happen, and interferences, and things that can affect our analyses. So the metals and soil is one of those products that needs to be digested by a specific method. And it should be digested using either EPA method 3050, which is your hot plate or hot block digestion, or method 3051, which is your microwave. And all promulgated revisions are acceptable for that. The recovery of the analytes for the metals and soil is extremely dependent on following the methods exactly as written. So remember, you're being judged against your peer laboratories who are all following these methods. And the methods are very specific as far as how much acid we're supposed to add, what temperature we're supposed to heat to on the hot plates, and for what period of time. For the microwave, it's very specific as far as the program that you're supposed to use for the temperatures, the pressures, and the time so that you're extracting a certain amount of the analyte. Therefore, altering the amount of acid used, the heating temperature, the digestion times, the microwave settings are going to have a dramatic effect on the amount of analyte that you can leach out of the sample. And let me explain that a little bit. Many of the earth metals are found in the native soil at very high concentrations but only a portion of these analytes can be leached out using the methods that we're talking about. In the metal, in the soil itself, there are what are called silicate structures. The rigorous nature of the 3050 and 3051 methods are only going to be able to leach out a certain amount. Some of these silicate structures contain high levels of your earth metals that aren't going to come out because you're not going to be able to break apart that silicate structure with the amount of acid and the time and temperature that you're using. However, if you were able to completely break down that soil and break apart those silicate structures, you're going to see that you can get dramatically higher amounts of those earth metals. For those of you that happen to use ERA's metals and soil for your QC or your reference material, you'll notice that there's a column on there called a total concentration. That total concentration is the amount of, of analyte that is in that sample if you could completely break down that. And I'm going to use aluminum as an example. So if I could use a total acid digestion procedure or a neutron activation or an XRF procedure, I could probably see about 60,000 milligram per kilogram of aluminum. It's a very high amount. However, the 3050 procedure or the 3051 procedure is only going to be able to leach out about 9 to 10,000 of that, significantly smaller amount. Now, the more rigorous the digestion that you're using, the more amount of that analyte you're going to get out. So if I use more nitric acid or more HCl, or I heat it maybe a little hotter, or instead of digesting for two hours, I digest for three hours, I'm going to be able to leach out a higher amount of that analyte. However, you're not doing the method the way it's written. I get a lot of phone calls from people who fail getting really high values, and they say to me, but I'm doing a better digestion. Um, my answer to that is, you're doing a more rigorous digestion, but the procedures are written for a certain reason. And if you're doing a digestion that's pulling out more metals, when you run your regular field samples, you may be over-reporting the amount of analyte that's in the soil. And you may be causing something to be reported above a regulatory limit that may not be there. With soils, 
if an analyte can't be leached out of the soil, it's generally not a major hazard to the human population or to the ecology. So it's very important, and again, I'm probably going to say this a dozen times during our, our talk today, that you've got to do the methods exactly as written because those more rigorous digestions are going to cause higher amounts. And where it's going to happen is with these analytes that are found in natively in high concentrations. There's a lot of analytes in the metal where there's nothing in the background found natively in the soil. So what you're going to get out is what we fortify in. And there you're going to get back 100% even if you do a more rigorous digestion. So people will say, you know, I hit everything else 100% and I got my aluminum, calcium, iron, magnesium are really high. And the reason you did that is because those are very high in the native soil. So when we're analyzing the soil, got to remember that there's a lot of analytes in there. ERA certifies 32 different metals in that soil. So interferences in the analyses are very prominent. If you're running that sample by ICP, make sure that those interferences are accounted for in your inter-element corrections. I want you to know that the soil is very high in iron, aluminum, and calcium, which are three of your four major analytes that you do your interference check samples for. So make sure that your IECs are used on ICP and that they're set accurately. Dilute your samples properly so that you can eliminate some of those interferences, especially from iron and aluminum, which you're going to see at potentially 10 to 25,000 milligram per kilogram in the soil. If you happen to be running the sample by ICPMS, remember that the chloride ion will cause interferences in your masses. You're going to see an interference in arsenic at mass 75 from an argon chloride bond. Argon has a mass of 40, chloride has a mass of 35, which is going to give you a false positive for a mass of 75. So you're going to see high, high numbers for arsenic. Same thing for vanadium. You're going to have an oxygen chloride bond, which you're going to see at a mass of 51 because you've got oxygen at 16 and chloride at 35. So if you have HCl in your digest for ICPMS, you're going to see high values for those two metals. So I would highly recommend omitting the HCl when you're digesting samples for analysis by ICPMS. Make sure that if you're using some of the lower level techniques for analysis, such as cold vapor for mercury or graphite furnace, that your samples are diluted to quantitate within your calibration ranges. If your samples are over your range, you're going to lose the regression equation on your curve as it gets to a certain concentration that will plateau and it will give you low numbers. So make sure that you're quantitating within your calibration range. Always important as in any analysis, calibrate the instrument every time you run the samples. These samples can actually also be run by flame AA and spectrophotometric methods. I don't I highly recommend not using them if you can't if you don't have to because there's going to be a lot of interferences from other metals in those analyses. They're very highly susceptible to interferences from other metals. If you're going to be running these by spectrophotometric methods, make sure that the pH is run at the yeah, the samples are run at the same pH that your standards are. pH is very critical in spec methods. A change in the pH will have a dramatic effect on the color change of your, of your analytes. So let's talk a little bit about our anions in soil. Anions in soil is a little different because it's quite diff difficult to find promulgated digestion methods. There's not a lot out there with respect to how do we digest the anions. So ERA has put in their instructions to extract this sample using a deionized water leach. If we use a chemical leach, like is common for fluoride, you're going to extract out a significantly higher value of fluoride than you will with a DI water leach. So that everybody's being judged equally and that everything is, it, we're, we're all looking at the same amount of analyte, our instructions will tell you to use a DI water leach. Because again, the recovery of those analytes is extremely dependent on the extraction procedure. So I'm recommending using a 10 gram aliquot, mixing it with 100 mils of DI water and leaching for an hour. Then you can filter and analyze by your normal procedures. 
If you want to use a less amount of soil or a greater amount of soil, that's fine. Um, just make sure that when you go to calculate your final results, you take into consideration your preparation factor. So you have to take into, a cons into consideration what your final volume is, what your initial volume is. But make sure you're doing a deionized water leach for these so that you're analyzing the sample using the same procedures as your peer laboratories. And again, with the anions, there's a lot of analytes in there. There's six analytes that we're certifying for. There's also a whole host of other analytes that could cause some interferences. So a couple of things to think about. If you're running the sample by ion chromatography, which is the most popular method um, that I see results reported by, make sure that you've got proper resolution between that fluoride and that chloride peak. Chloride is found significantly higher in this, in this soil than fluoride is. So it could be possible that you'll have a small fluoride peak and a pretty large chloride peak next to it. As that chloride peak gets bigger, it's going to push itself upfield towards the fluoride peak, and there could be potential of incomplete resolution between those two peaks. So make sure that you can, you can properly resolve those. One of the ways to do that would be to dilute the sample and, and drop the chloride concentration down a little bit. One of the big issues for fluoride by ion chromatography is that water dip. So water will give you a negative elution on the, the chromatograph for ion chromatography. So your baseline is going to come out, your water is going to come out first, you'll see that big negative water dip. Um, if you're using an instrument that has self-regenerating suppressors. Some of you that are running chemical suppression instruments won't see that water dip as prominently because you've got a much lower baseline. But please make sure that your background is low enough and that your column is clean enough so that that water dip comes all the way back up to the baseline before the fluoride peak starts. Okay, if your background pressure is too high, the fluoride is going to come out too early in your chromatogram, and it's going to start eluding before the water dip is done, and you're going to end up getting negative interference from your water dip. One of the ways to counter that is to run the sample diluted and to dilute it in the eluent. Diluting samples in an eluent will eliminate that water dip and will help with the resolution of the fluoride peak. Again, as with any test that you're doing that requires calibration prior to analyzing samples, make sure that you're diluting your samples to be within your calibration range. Samples that are run below your range might show erroneous results because we're not quite sure when we're below our range where we're being, we're, we're noticing a distinction between instrument noise and actual peak quantitation. Above the calibration range, you're going to get to a point where your straight line regression is going to plateau off and you'll end up getting lower results. It's not uncommon to run the anions by spectrophotometric methods, especially for nitrate and chloride. So make sure that your pH is adjusted properly because, again, a difference in pH is going to cause a difference in color development which will give you erroneous results. For those of you using selective electrode methods for the anions, make sure that you're using an ionic strength adjuster to set those pH levels. Electro electrochemical tests are very dependent on the pH of the samples as well so that you're making sure that we're setting everything at the exact same levels. Please remember that this sample contains chloride so if you're running nitrate by selective electrode, nitrate is very susceptible to chloride interference. So the use of an ion selective suppressor is necessary. Generally some kind of a silver based solution that will precipitate out the silver chloride and remove the interference for nitrate. Another thing that's important to remember when you're reporting your results, make sure you report your nitrate as nitrogen and not as nitrate. So if you're calibrating your equipment as nitrate, you'll need to do a conversion of the value from nitrate to nitrogen. Same thing with phosphate. Make sure you report your phosphate results as phosphorus and not as phosphate. 
I look at the results of every study that we get, and there are a handful of people who are failing, not because they're running this, the, the test incorrectly, but they're re reporting as the compound and not as the element. So make sure you don't fall into that, that issue. I'll talk a little bit about the hexachrome in soil. This particular sample should be digested using the EPA method 3060A, which is the, excuse me, the alkaline digestion. Again, the recovery of this analyte is very dependent on the extraction procedure. As hexachrome can easily be reduced to trichrome, the elimination of any potential acidic sources is important in the extraction of the hexachrome. The heat of the heating plate and the time of digestion are also critical. The sample should be digested at 90 to 95 degrees for 60 minutes. Heating it outside of that range or for longer than the 60 minutes is going to have a dramatic effect on the amount of hexachrome being leached. So make sure that you're running the method exactly as it's written because that's what your peer laboratories are doing. When you're digesting the samples, make sure that the samples do not go all the way to dryness. If you dry the sample out, it's going to stick to your beaker and you're going to lose some of the hexachrome. So make sure it doesn't go to dryness. If your solution happens to, the volume of the solution happens to get low, it's okay to add a little bit more of your digestion solution in there. As long as it doesn't go to dryness, you should be fine. So the analysis of hexachrome is very dependent on the pH of the sample, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So the method itself recommends you do a two-stage pH adjustment. So if you look at step 7.7, it tells you to take a 5 molar nitric acid solution, adding it dropwise to your sample while stirring. Here's the reason why they want you to add it dropwise. If you add nitric acid too fast to the sample, you're going to get little pockets of very low pH before the stir bar has a chance to dissociate and dissolute that nitric acid into the sample. If you get low values of pH, that low pH is going to cause the hexachrome to reduce down to trichrome and you'll lose that and get low results. So you'll notice that as if you're adding it too fast, you'll see a lot of bubbles coming up out of your solution. That shows that you're generating CO2 too quickly and that happens when the pH gets too low. So it takes a lot more time to add it dropwise, but it'll add to the quality of your analysis in that you're not losing any of the hexachrome by adding it dropwise to that pH of between 7 and 8. If you're going to analyze the sample soon after you do this initial pH adjustment, if the pH gets down to 6.5, 6.4, you're still going to be okay. So the method itself will say if you're out of if you go below that pH of 7 to discard and to redigest the sample. The reason they're saying that is if the sample sits in a lower pH for a longer period of time, you're going to get this reduction. So what they want to try to avoid is the pH going into uh, an extremely acidic environment of say pH is down to 5, 4, 3 where you're going to lose your hexachrome. You'll then want to filter that first pH adjusted sample if you see any flocculent forming. And it's not uncommon in the soil samples to see flock forming. If we don't filter out that flock, that flock is going to cause interferences because it'll absorb light and it'll give you a falsely high result. So make sure if you see any flocculent forming when you're doing that initial pH adjustment that you do a second filtering of the sample to remove any of that flock. So in analyzing for our hexachrome, there are two main techniques for analyzing it. Okay? The first method is method 7199, which is ion chromatography, and the second is 7196A, which is your UV visible or your spec method. The 7196 is by far and away the most common method being used for doing that. So if you're doing the spectrophotometric method, again, ensure that the sample is diluted within that quantitation range, uh, your, excuse me, your calibration range. It's extremely important, you know, for the reasons that we've discussed before. 
If you're running ion chromatography, remember that it requires a post-column derivative technique and quantitating on a visible detector at 530 nanometers. Chloride and sulfate are interferences on your ion chromatography at very high concentrations. I want to let you know that the ERA samples don't contain chloride or sulfate above the load that the column can handle. So those won't be an issue on your column load. For UV visible, you got to make sure again that you're adjusting the pH properly. It should be adjusted to between 2 and 2.5 for proper color development. pH is outside of that range as for any spectrophotic method, spectrophotometric method, are going to affect the color development and they're going to result in low values. Okay, also remember that pH adjustment is going to cause CO2 to form. Just like when you did your initial pH where you saw the bubbles coming up, dropping that pH is going to cause CO2 to form when we're doing the coloring step. So what's really important is when you take that sample and pour it into your cuvette to analyze, make sure that there's no CO2 bubbles. They have a tendency to stick on the wall of the cuvette, and if it does, it's going to cause erroneous results. It's going to affect the amount of analyte that you're seeing on your detector. So I'd recommend is when you pour that sample in your cuvette, take a quick look at it, make sure that there's no CO2 bubbles. If there are, remove those before you're running it. Spectrophotometric methods all require a certain amount of time for full color development to happen. Most of the methods that that color development will stay for an extended period of time. Hexachrome is one of those tests where the color development doesn't stay for a long period of time. So to make sure that the color development happens fully, make sure you wait at least 10 minutes before you start analyzing your sample. However, the color will fade more quickly in your hexavalent chromium analysis than it does for other ones. So I would recommend trying to run those samples within about 10 minutes of the full color development to avoid potential color fading. So our next product that I'd like to talk about with you is our nutrients in soil. The ERA nutrients in soil can be tested for ammonia, keldol nitrogen, total phosphorus, and total organic carbon. So I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about each analyte. Recovery of ammonia is extremely dependent on the extraction procedure again, as is the case for most analytes. It is acceptable for the ERA product to extract ammonia either by your distillation procedure or by a deionized water leach. We've done a lot of testing here at ERA using both techniques, and we find that we can recover the techniques within about 5% of each other. So the methods are fairly equal. Make sure that if you distill samples for your regular field samples that you also distill our sample for your PT. You've got to run it the same way you run your field samples. If you're distilling the sample, please remember that our nutrients in soil contains organic nitrogen, which we use for TKN. So you want to ensure that the pH is at 9.5 to avoid any hydrolysis of the organic nitrogen. Make sure that you're capturing that distillate into the appropriate buffer solution for the analysis technique that you're going to do. If you're doing titration, capture it into boric acid. If you're doing selective electrode or the phenate analysis, make sure you're capturing into sulfuric acid. If you're doing the deionized water leach, I recommend that you leach it for approximately eight, one hour, which will help you fully leach out the ammonia that's in the soil and give you results similar to the distillation technique. So either the leachate or the distillate should be analyzed either by selective electrode, titration, or the phenate method for the UV vis. If you're doing titration, remember that distillation is required. If you're doing either the phenate or the selective electrode, again, ensure that your sample is diluted to within your calibration range. If you're doing the titration, the normality of your titrant is required in the calculation of your final result. 
So make sure you standardize that titrant first so that you have an accurate evaluation of what the normality is for that titrant. It's also make sure that your indicator solutions are fresh. It's recommended to make them monthly. What happens if your indicator solutions are fresh, it might take longer for you to see that color change happen. And in that case, you're going to be using more titrant than you should be using, and it's going to give you erroneous results. So make sure that that uh, indicator is fresh. If you're doing the ISC technique, the selective electrode technique actually analyzes the ammonium ion and not actually ammonia. The ammonium ion will be released at a pH greater than 12. And what happens is you've got ammonium ion on the inside of your probe, a, a semi-permeable membrane, and then ammonium ions being released out of the sample on the outside of that probe. And what you're measuring is the difference in the pressure between the constant ammonium ion inside pushing pressure on one side of the membrane and the varying degrees of ammonia or concentrations of the ammonium ion putting pressure on the other side of the membrane. So most of you probably are using the selective, uh, the, the uh, ionic strength adjuster, that blue solution which has methylene blue and sodium uh, hydroxide in it. And if that solution stays blue, you know your pH is greater than 11. If you're only using sodium hydroxide to adjust the pH, make sure that you measure that pH first so that it's greater than 11. If it's less than 11, you're not going to get full release of the ammonium ion. It's going to give you low numbers. Make sure you're stirring that sample so that you have a homogeneous mixture. Also, when you're doing your selective electrode techniques, a change in temperature is going to have a dramatic effect on the millivolt readings that your meter is seeing. So heat, preventing heat transfer is a very important thing to do when you're doing ISC techniques. So you want to put a heat transfer barrier on your stir plate, whether that be some cork board or packing material, something that will absorb the heat because as you're stirring the sample, that stir plate is going to generate a little bit of heat. And even if it only changes your temperature by half a degree, that could be a couple of percentage points um, difference in your analysis. So it does affect your results. So make sure you're using some kind of a heat transfer barrier. Also, Keep your dynamic calibration ranges as small as possible. The smaller the dynamic range, the more accurate your quantitation will be. Here's an example. For ammonia, if you're calibrating from 0.1 to 100 and trying to run your sample at 2, you have such a wide dynamic range that you're going to get your extremes of your ranges, whether at the low end or the high end, aren't always a straight line regression. It's more of an S-shaped regression. The bigger your dynamic range, the larger that S-shaped region of the range is going to be, and the less accurate your numbers are going to be at the extremes of the range. So the smaller the range is, the, the dynamic range is, the smaller those S-shaped portions of your curve are going to be at the extremes of your range, and the more accurate you're going to be throughout that quantitation range. Remember that our soil is relatively high in both calcium and magnesium, and you want to minimize interferences by precipitating out those ions. Your hypochlorite is unstable, so make the oxidizing solution daily. And also remember that the 5% solution will degrade over time, so replace that solution at least quarterly for best results. Also remember that the sodium nitroprusside is photodegradative. So store that in an amber bottle to protect it from light, and again, make that fresh at least monthly. Similar to the anions, make sure you're reporting your results as ammonia and not as nitrogen. Or as, as, I'm sorry, as nitrogen and not as ammonia. Okay, so if you're calibrating your equipment as ammonia, you'll want to convert those values over to nitrogen. So when we talk about TKN, Recovery of that TKN, again, is extremely dependent on the digestion procedure. Our nutrients in soil will contain both organic forms of, ammonia, of nitrogen and ammonia nitrogen. So that sample needs to be digested first to break apart the organic nitrogen bond. The soil also contains nitrate nitrogen. So you cannot use a total nitrogen analysis for this because you'll not, remember TKN is ammonia nitrogen and organic nitrogen, not nitrate or nitrate nitrogen. 
Also remember too that um, uh, that nitrate nitrogen um, does have an interference for TKN analysis, but the level of nitrogen in our soil is not high enough to cause that interference. As ammonia is part of the TKN value, do not perform the ammonia removal step or else you're going to be removing a big portion of your TKN value. For those of you who do the digestion procedure, um, the copper sulfate that you use for your digestion solution has been shown to be an effective replacement for mercury. So if you're worried about mercury because of the toxic nature of that, the copper sulfate that you use to make that digestion solution along with your potassium sulfate and your sulfuric acid works effectively. It's actually what ERA uses here internally in our samples. For our nutrients and soil sample, the digestion procedure, the block digestion procedure, will effectively convert all of the organic nitrogen over to ammonium. So distillation of our sample is not necessary, but if you do that as part of your normal procedure, you should also do that on our sample. When you're doing the digestion process, make sure you cover the top of the digestion vessels. Not covering the tops of those will result in a loss of sulfuric acid. When you lose the sulfuric acid, it's going to increase the digestion temperature, and that will cause a loss of the ammonium. So make sure you're covering that. Also remember that the digestion temperature is especially critical. If the temperature doesn't get to the 380 degrees, you may not completely break apart the organic nitrogen bond for the substrate that ERA uses for our sample. So it's got to be at least 380 degrees for an extended period of time to break apart that bond. However, there is also a second caveat that if the temperature goes over 400 degrees, you're going to risk volatilizing the ammonium that you already have in there. So it's critical for this test to keep your temperature between 380 and 400 degrees to capture all of the TKN that you're looking for. Make sure that the sample is digested long enough so the solution is transparent and pale green. That is your indicator that you've broken apart your organic nitrogen bonds and you've converted everything to ammonium. Our experience here at ERA shows that a, at least a two and a half hour digestion at the 380 degrees will be effective for the complete conversion of the organic nitrogen over to ammonium. When your digestion is complete, try to minimize any crystallization of the solution as the ammonium tends to get trapped in those crystals, potentially resulting in low recoveries. When you're analyzing it, the analysis is fairly similar to the analysis of the ammonia in our soil. So it's the same type of things you need to worry about and be careful about when you're running it. So I won't go into any more so that we'll have enough time to talk about some other things. So total phosphorus. Total phosphorus can be digested either using the same procedure that you use for the metals in soil or by the sulfuric nitric or persulfate digestion procedures followed by spectrophotometric analysis. Most of you will actually use the ICP or ICPMS analysis with the 3050 or 3051 digestions, so I won't go into specifics about that because we already talked about that. Um, ERA does use an organic form of phosphorus to manufacture our nutrients in soil, so that if you're doing the spectrophotometric method, you've got to break apart that organophosphorus bond, converting that over to orthophosphate before you're running your spec. If you're doing the spec analysis, make sure that you digest your calibration standards if you can, so that if your process isn't completely efficient, you're going to see the same effects on your calibration standards that you do on the samples themselves. So digesting it will count for, account for any digestion inefficiencies. Again, your ICP or ICPMS analysis, use the same precautions as you do for the metals and soil. Spec analysis, again, pH is critical for proper color development. Ensure that your sample is adjusted properly or you're not going to get the proper color development and it's going to result in low numbers. pH adjustment is routinely done by adding a drop of phenolphthalein indicator and then adding sulfuric acid until the pink color disappears. Okay. At that pink 
at that pH, phenolphthalein color will disappear at a specific pH. So that's letting you know that you're setting the pH to a proper value. Again, dilute your samples to quantitate within your calibration range. And as I discussed with your ammonia, the smaller the dynamic range of your calibration, the smaller the S-shaped portions of those curves are going to be at the extremes of the calibration range, and the more accurate your quantitation will be. Organic carbon. There's two common procedures that I see being used to analyze for TOC in our soil. The first is the combustion IR method, and the second is the Walkley Black titration. As the TOC is fairly high in our soil, if you're going to analyze by combustion infrared, it's recommended that you use a carbon expansion chamber because you're going to need to use small amounts of soil. And if you don't have that carbon expansion chamber, the amount of soil you're going to use is going to be so small to see on your instrument that it's going to be difficult to get a representative aliquot from your sample. If you're doing the Walkley Black titration, accurate analysis of that blank is critical because you're not, you're not actually titrating organic carbon. What you're doing is you're titrating the amount of dichromate that's in the solution. So when you do your digestion process, you're adding 10 milliliters of a dichromate solution to each sample. And what's happening is that the dichromate is reacting with the organic carbon and you're actually measuring the amount of dichromate that's left over. So when you're doing your blank, obviously there's no organic or there should be no organic carbon in your blank analyses. So you're going to have the full amount of dichromate in there. It's going to take a certain amount of your titrant to titrate the dichromate. So you're using that as your baseline. So doing that as accurately is critical, and then you're subtracting the amount of titrate you're using by back titrating the chromate that's left over in your other samples, subtracting out the blank, and then going through your calculation. So it's very critical as the most important step in this procedure is making sure that you're adding the exact same amount of dichromate to each sample. I would highly recommend using a Class A calibrated glass pipette to add the dichromate solution and not using the adjustable pipettes so that you know you're getting the exact amount of, car of dichromate in there. When you're adding the sulfuric acid, add it slowly to prevent loss of TOC from sticking to the sides of the flask. So add it slowly, swirl slowly before you start your 30 minute period for the digestion. Make sure that you're keeping that flask on a heat absorbable material. You want to prevent heat transfer from a bench into your flask because that can cause a loss of TOC. So again, just like you did with your stir plate and your ammonia analysis, using a cork board or some kind of packing material will help prevent that heat loss. When you're titrating, you notice that as you add your titrant, your solution's going to go from a yellow to a light green to a darker green and finally to your magenta. When you hit that magenta, you've reached your endpoint. Let that sample sit for 20 to 30 seconds to make sure that that magenta doesn't turn back green. If it does, that's an indication that you haven't reached your endpoint and you'll need to continue titrating. So be patient with this analysis to make sure that your sample stays in that magenta color. So analyzing our pH in soil. You're going to be using a 50-50 mixture of soil and deionized water. The EPA method 9045A, the SW846 method, recommends using a 20 gram aliquot. Using a larger mass of soil and um, consequently more DI water will, I think, allow better for, for a better contact with the electrode. The important thing is that we're using a 50-50 mixture. So however how much soil you're using, use the same amount of deionized water in order to do your leaching process. I've noticed better results and more accurate results here if we use a little bit more soil and more water so that we can get that electrode down, get good contact with the reference electrode in that solution without sticking the probe down into the soil itself. Make sure that you mix that sample for at least five minutes to get a good leachate out of there. Let it settle for an hour so that the heavier clays and things will settle on the bottom and you've got a good supernatant liquid on top for your analysis. <clears throat> 
If you're going to measure, if you're going to measure it directly in that same beaker that you mixed it in, make sure that you don't immerse the electrode into the settled soil because that's going to cause an effect on the contact it's making with the reference junction. If it's possible, and I'd highly recommend that, decant off that supernatant liquid into a separate container and measure it in that. Therefore, you're minimizing the possibility of putting that electrode into your settled soil. I'd also highly recommend, if you don't, to calibrate your pH meter prior to analyzing the sample. It's always a good practice to calibrate that each time you do it. Our TCLP in soil. Again, the extraction process is critical. You have to use method 1311 to extract out the TCLP in soil. ERA has instructions to tell you to always use extraction fluid number one. If you use extraction fluid number two, you're going to get a different amount of leachate than you will using fluid number one. So we specifically tell you to do that. And we do that for two reasons. One, so that everybody's doing everything the same. And two, so that you don't have to take extra sample and go through the step of, well, what's the pH to determine which extraction fluid I'm supposed to use. For effective leaching, that pH of that extraction fluid number one needs to be within a very certain range. You're going to be able to leach metals out in a certain range. Outside of that range, you're going to have a dramatic effect on what you can leach out. So you need to make sure that you're within that 4.88 to 4.98 range. If not, adjust the pH of your extraction fluid prior to beginning your tumbling. Use 100 grams of soil and 2 liters of extraction fluid number one. It's critical to tumble it for that 18 plus or minus 2 hours. Tumbling it for less time is going to leach out less analyte. Tumbling it for more time is going to leach out more analyte. As per the method, you should be rinsing that filter in 1% nitric acid and then DI rinsing. Make sure that you don't have any analyte on that filter paper because you're going to get some contamination and falsely high results. Also, after you filter, make sure you preserve your leachate with nitric to a pH of less than 2. With higher values, you're going to lose some analytes. Barium is one specific one that will be it that will fall out of solution after a certain period of time at a higher pH. And although digestion of the samples is not necessary because you've already got dissolved metals in there, digest the sample if it's part of your normal process. Once filtered, the TCLP sample can be analyzed. Again, digest it if it's part of your normal procedure. If you're doing mercury analysis, digestion is necessary. So you need to go through the, the 74, 71, I believe, digestion process for mercury. If you're digesting your samples, it's also recommended for mercury you digest your calibration standards as well because that will help account for any efficiencies in the digestion process. If you're digesting for metals, follow the EPA method 3015 for digestion or an equivalent method. Let the digestate cool to room temperature prior to filtering because if it's this, the digestate is warm, your analytes are going to expand. As you know with anything, when something gets hot, it expands. Think about a, a soda. When you put a soda out in the sun, things expand. It's going to happen to your analytes as well, and you want to avoid the analytes sticking to the filter paper because it's, it's warm. Please remember that the TCLP extract will contain high levels of sodium because you're using acetic acid which is, and uh, sodium hydroxide for your extraction fluid, which is going to put a high level of sodium in there. So make sure that your instrument can account for those high levels of sodium, especially if you're using an ICP technique. That sample will be more viscous than your calibration materials. So I would highly recommend using an internal standard to help you counter for uptake issues with a highly viscous sample. So our last topic today, and I know I'm running a little bit long, is for your cyanide. One of the most important things I want you to remember is when you're distilling cyanide, select an appropriate amount of soil to distill. Okay? A lot of you do that MIDI distillation procedure, which you're only using 50 mils of solution to digest. If you use too much soil in there, 
your salute your digestion solution isn't going to get down into the bottom part of your soil that's in there and it's not going to contact all the soil and you're going to get low numbers so I wouldn't recommend using three four five grams of soil use a smaller amount the cyanide in the soil is going to be high enough that if you use a one gram or a half gram amount of soil you're going to get a much better you're going to get much better contact with your distillation solution and a much better distillation if you're doing the amenable portion you've got to treat it in either dark or amber light because iron cyanides which are in this the cyanide in soil will decompose under UV light and they will give you a high bias for the amenable portion make sure you're testing for excessive chlorine during your process for that hour to make sure there's enough chlorine to to do your your chlorination process the usual interferences that you see in your cyanide method aren't present in the ERA sample so the use of sulfamic acid bismuth nitrate sodium arsenate they're not necessary in our sample when you're distilling make sure you've got adequate bubbling going on because otherwise you're going to get a backflow up out of that air inlet and you're going to lose cyanide instead of it going over into the scrubbing solution so bubbling is critical for that and because the cyanide distillation process may not be 100% efficient it's recommended that you either distill the entire curve or at least distill a midpoint standard to manage your efficiency you really want to make sure that you've got a distillation efficiency of at least 90 percent or greater in that distilled standard analyze your distillates as quickly as possible our history here and our experience here at ERA has shown that the distillate if you leave it refrigerated can be stable for about 48 hours your colorimetric analysis requires a chlorine to produce cyanogen chloride so make sure that your chloramine tea is fresh use it within six hours of manufacture one of the biggest mistakes I see in reporting for amenable cyanide is that you're doing your distillation reporting your total cyanide value then you're chlorinating the sample redistilling it and running it what you're analyzing there is the non amenable portion not the amenable portion so make sure that when you do your initial and then your second distillation that you're quantitating amenable by subtraction so take the initial value you got the value you got after chlorinating because the chlorinating is going to remove the value that's amenable to chlorination leaving behind the non amenable we have a lot of people that are reporting that total portion that's left over instead of doing subtraction so make sure that you're not reporting the wrong value make sure that your reagents are fresh and that you allow adequate time for color development okay couple of things avoiding surprises follow the methods exactly as they're written I can't stress that enough when you're doing PTs run your analyses as soon as possible allow time for things to go wrong I would highly recommend establishing a routine quality control process and using certified reference materials for it also make sure you're reporting your, your results on a dry weight basis although ERA does dry our product a lot of you are in humid climates where if your sample sits around in your laboratory you could be gaining some moisture so report your results on a dry weight basis so we went real long today because we had a lot of things to talk about so those of you that have questions if you've already written them in to me great I'll answer those and I'll send them back to you um, otherwise if you have questions email them to me you'll see my email address here if you want to call me you have my office number there um, so I will answer all the questions that you have and we'll get those answers posted on our website as we usually do if you want to contact us here's all of our contact information guys thanks a lot for spending this past hour with me um, I appreciate you taking your time out in your busy days I'm hoping you're gonna leave here with some knowledge that you didn't have before that's gonna help you along in your way again if you need any information or you need some help give me a call thanks guys and have a great day